Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen Wa salatu wa salam ala Rasulillah Alhamdulillah This is now episode 60 of the podcast The Four of Myself with Mahdi Locke Author of The Big Step And today's topic is Reflecting on death and dealing with death um, It's in light of recent events I'll confess, I'll admit um, But it's also a topic based on a poem uh, that I have on my blog. Um, it's actually a topic that I've been wanting to do, wanting to cover and do a podcast on for I think about a year now, and I've never got around to do it. So, alhamdulillah, I'm up early in the morning. Uh, I've got the poem in front of me. I've got the blog post in front of me. Um, and before I delve into it, I just want to make it clear that this is a this is a very very uh, broad topic, and it's a very, very deep topic. So it's you, you can't exhaust it in one podcast or one book or whatever it is. It, ha- it, it can be covered in several podcasts, it can be covered in several videos. Um, so I'm not making any claim here whatsoever to be covering this topic in depth. Um, I think another reason, another reason why I want to do this now is that, inshallah, in the coming uh, weeks and months, maybe shortly before, even before Ramadan, um, my translation of Sharh Sador uh, by Imam Jalaluddin Suyulti uh, is going to be published as a book that covers um, all the ahadith and verses and narrations from the first generations and onwards regarding death and all the stages from from the moment. Uh, someone's soul leaves their body all the way through to the day of judgment and entry into paradise uh, for the believer so that's another reason to be talking about this now the poem is by uh, the Abbasid poet uh, Abu 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 Atta Abu if I say that correctly um, interesting name now this book, or sorry, the poem is from a book called Fishir al Abbasi uh, by Dr. Yusuf Khulayf. Um, it was published in Cairo a long time ago. It's quite, a, quite an old book, but it's still available in bookshops uh, in the Muslim world. Uh, so he's from the Abbasid era. Uh, and there's just these few lines of poetry to go over. Um, now, Starts off where he says, "Fakartu fi dunya wa which would translate as, "I thought about, or I have thought about the world and its newness, how new it is." Fi the jami o yabla, and then everything that is new falls away or falls into ruin or, or goes into decay. So this is what, this is the first thing he says. So in the commentary, so in other words he says I, I think about this world oh, and I reflect on it and I, can, I, 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 I contemplate the state of this world and how there are so many things in it things that have been created things that have been brought into existence recently Right, you look around. You look around. In other words, you look around the world, and everything you see is something that came into being recently. Uh, and what he doesn't say explicitly is that there's nothing in this world, or very few things in this world, that are actually old. Right, you rarely see anything in this world that's maybe older than fifty years, older than sixty years, older than seventy years. Right, uh, especially we're talking about people. And then you know, there's buildings. There are a few buildings that you know can maybe 100 years old, and so on and so forth, or hundreds of years old. But most of these things, they are, uh, or they have, gone out of existence and disappeared. 
this is the nature of the dunya. Things do not last, right? That's why he says, "Fida jumi o jadidiha yabla aina." You should say jadid yabqa, right? There's no, there's no new thing that remains in that state of newness. Rather, it has to. There's no. It's inevitable that that thing will break down and deteriorate and, and deteriorate. Uh, and by using the word yebla, he's indicating two meanings. Okay, just just if if uh, if anyone's not following exactly here, just remember this is all my blog, right? This 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 full Arabic text here uh, is on my blog. I'll link it below the video. Um, by using the word yebla, he's indicating two meanings. The, the first is al bila, right? That's 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 the first. Uh, Meaning that he that he's getting at, which is um, decline and deterioration, and the second is bala, wal baliya, right? Which again means tribulation and trial and so forth, right? So there's deterioration. This 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 root word, which is the actual root, if we go into sarf, is ba lam wow. We have the meaning of bila. This word bila, which means decline and de deterioration, but then we also have bala and baliya. Bala, obviously, as we know, or as we should know, and it's clear in the Quran, uh, is trial and tribulation. So there's a clear relationship between the two meanings, because in ibtila, in trial and tribulation, and with affliction, one states change, and they can lead to, or they or they lead to, bila and halak, right? Through, so there are trials and tribulations, people's states change, and then this leads to deterioration and destruction in the end of the day, right? or in the, end of, in, in the end of the matter. Because that's where we're all going. And there's no escape from it. There's no escape from deterioration, or just as there is no escape from deterioration and decline, there's no escape from tribulation. Because Allah has said, and this is Surah Al-Baqarah, I 155, Like we will definitely, not most assuredly, test you. And if you want to really go into the Arabic here, you have the lamb of Tawqid, you have a lamb, you have the noon, the noon, of, it's a Tawqid, noon of Tawqid, it's a, it, it's, this word is being heavily uh, emphasized. Like we will definitely, most assuredly, test you with something with a portion of fear and hunger and a lack of wealth a lack of anfus right and thamarats um, and this, these are references to uh, so we have we have fear we have hunger we have a, a lack of wealth and the loss of anfus right the um, the law says naqsim al anfus this refer this is a reference this is a reference to death that death itself is death itself is a test and especially the death of loved ones when loved ones die this is this is a test this is something we have to we have to go through we have to endure and it's inevitable and thamarat now that might be translated as fruits but there are um, uh, in the tef in the tefsir literature references to this being the death of children because children are your fruits. Um, there's one hadith that's narrated by Ahmed and the Tirmidhi where uh, the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, he said, if a child dies, if the child of a slave of Allah dies, Allah says to the angels, have you taken the child of one of my slaves? And the angels will say yes, and he says, "Did you take?" And this is the Arabic. He says, "Qadatum thamrata fuaidihi." Did you take the fruit of his heart? And that's what a child is—the fruit of your heart. Did you take the fruit of his heart? And they say yes. And then Allah says, "And what does my slave say? What is he saying now? Or what has he said regarding?" The death of his child, and they say, Hamidaka was right? Like he praises you. 
the, the, the response to the slave is he praises you, and then we does istirja, which he says, inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raji'un, right? Which is there in the ayah. Because if you go back to the ayah, well, Allah says, we we'll definitely surely test you. And then Allah says, الَّذِينَ إِذَا أَصَابَهُمْ مُصِيبَةٌ قَالُوا إِنَّ لِلَّهِ وَإِنَّ إِلَيْهِ رَاجِعُونَ Right, those who, because the end of the eyes, we've actually saw Birin, be glad times to those who are patient, those who, when they are afflicted with something, when afflicted with an affliction, they say, to Allah we belong, and to Him we return. So, Allah then says, Allah the Exalted says to the angels, build for my slave a house in paradise, and call it the house of praise. So this is something for us all to bear in mind. So uh, back to the poem. So Abu Atahia, Abu Atahia, he says, "Wa umuriha duwalun." Right? Like they're, it's sort of, uh, it's in alternations. Right? All all the world's affairs are in alternations. I, nothing stays. No matter or no thing stays in one state, i.e., it, it changes. Right? Things are constantly changing. And he says, Bain al-Burri, Qallama tabqa, right? In other words, all the affairs of the dunya are alternations between created beings, between creatures. So whoever is in goodness, So whoever is in goodness and in well-being today could very well be in a state of tribulation and hardship tomorrow and the opposite is also true and rarely do you see someone uh, in a state of goodness or evil right or a state of tribulation for a long time right or for for a time that's not short and that's why and yes right so this is why or right? So this is why the human being should not strive for perfect happiness in this life, because it's not meant to be. But rather, it's it's a futile exercise. He's he's looking for something that does not exist, and rather, he must be patient and strive for. Or, the eternal life, al hayat al khalida. That's what you're. That's what you're looking at. That's what you're looking for, and that's what you're looking after. That's what you're seeking. Perfection is not in this life, and so if you're going to make that your goal in life, that I need, I need to be happy. I need to find happiness in this life, perfect happiness, and and, and I'll be free of all tribulations and free of all hardships. Well, you've come to the wrong place. This is not where it's meant to be. Go back to Surah Al-Baqarah one five five. Or Allah has said, we will most assuredly test you. You're going to have to, you, you will have to experience it. You're going to have to experience uh, poverty. You're going to experience hunger. You're going to experience the death of loved ones. You, you cannot avoid it. So, so if you're looking for perfection in this life, you're constantly going to be disappointed. Uh, then the poet says, he says, in other words, we'll go to the translation first, I forget, is he says, I passed by the graves and I wasn't able to distinguish between the slave and the master. That's a beautiful line. I passed by the graves or by the gravesite and I was not able to distinguish between the slave and the master. In other words, right? every soul shall taste death. There's no escape from it, regardless of whether one is a slave or a master, because the grave is the final destination. That's where everyone's going to end up. It doesn't matter whether you are from the elites, from the upper classes, or you're one of the one of the the paupers in the lower classes. It doesn't matter, or anything in between. Uh, and then we notice also the poet used the word mola instead of sayid, right? Because sayid, sayid clearly means Clearly, say the word say clearly means master. Whereas mola is one of these words in Arabic. Again, this goes back to the rules of sarf, where uh, it can be active or passive, right? It could mean slave or it could mean uh, uh, slave master, right? So so mola mil kalimat 
التي تفيد معنيين متعاكسين right like عبد سيد أي the فاعل and the مفعول and we can only distinguish between them because of uh, or by use of the of the context we look at the context we say okay that's what he means he's talking about if you're saying together عبد والمولى I can't distinguish between them then obviously he's talking about مولى here means uh, the slave so, sorry مولى yeah, means the master and عبد is the slave clearly Okay. Then he says, "Mazal the dunya munaghisa, munaghisa, lam yakh lam yakhlu sahibuha min al-balwa." So this ought to go into the Arabic. It's a bit difficult here. He says, "In other words, what it means here is the natural state of the dunya is that you're going to be." Uh, instead of izaj, like you're, you're going to be annoyed, you're going to be perturbed, you're going to be uncomfortable. You're never going to have this state of perfect relaxation. So, the, someone in this life will only find comfort, a little bit of comfort here and there in certain moments, certain fleeting moments, and then there will be difficulty and hardship that will come and pinch at him or bite him or or overwhelm him at some point. So whatever joy or comfort you have, some hardship will come and it will disturb that relaxation and comfort that you are enjoying. Um, so he says, and here he uses the term belua. Uh, يعني وبلا البلية ويوجد أن تجانس لفظي من هذا الكلمة والكلمة يبلا وقال ابن فارس في مقايس اللغة البلاء واللام والواء والياء أصلان أهدما الإخلاق شيء والثاني نوع من الاختبار. So this uh, we have we have ba and we have lam and then the wow and the la and the wow and the ya are are, are asli right so you have you have you basically we're talking about here in Arabic is we have two root words we have what's called in Arabic a mada we have two root words we have a ba a ba a lam and a wow and then a ba a lam and a ya and one of them refers to ikhlaqu shay the bringing something to existence and the second is a type of test and Allah knows best. But, but again, he keeps referring back to these words because we discussed earlier about the word bila, which is a uh, demise and deterioration. That's what it refers to. And then we have bela, which is trial and tribulation. So he says, the poet, the dunya is dar al wal humum, wa dar al ba'us, wal ahzan, wal shakwa. So the dunya is this abode of misfortune. It's an abode of uh, worries and anxieties. It's an abode of grief. And it's an abode of complaint. So we also do in this world, we complain, we have grievances. So, in other words, the dunya is an abode of afflictions and calamities. And above that, on top of that, it's, it's an abode of anxieties and sorrows. And then we have the du'a of the Messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, who said, Allahumma inni a'udhu bika min al-hammi wa huzn. Right, this is a well-known du'a. A'udhu bika min al-hammi wa huzn, wa huzn, wa ajzi wa kasli, and so forth. Um, but uh, he seeks refuge in, the Messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, this du'a, he's saying that we, should, we, we seek refuge, or oh Allah seek refuge in you from hem and huzn, from anxiety and from grief. And the difference between Ham and Huzn, as Imam Abdul Rahman al Jawzi says in his book, Atib al Ruhani, is that Al Ham is for the future and Huzn is for the past. So someone grieves over what, of, or over what has passed of his lifetime and the sins he has created and how he has fallen short with regards to his Lord's right. Uh, 
And he, Imam al Jolzi, what he says is that in this type of grief, or in, or in this type of in this type of grief, there's a benefit for the person who engages in it. Uh, Malik, Malik bin Dinar, he said, but, but to, the, to the extent that one grieves over the dunya, likewise, uh, one will be relieved of the hem of the akhirah, right? The, the, the anxiety of the akhirah. So you're stuck in a situation where you have hem and huzun. So hem is this anxiety about the future. Um, this idea that, oh, or just thinking that, well, what's going to happen in the future? Am I going to have a job? What's going to happen to my kids? Am I going to have enough money? How am I going to pay this off? How am I going to take care of this? Right? This is all uh, hem, anxiety. And it's recently I, I was, uh, I came across an article, part of an English textbook actually, but I was coming across an article about, you know, the, the three types of fear, right? They've never done the three types of fear. The, and anxiety is one of them. Um, this fear about the future and it's usually a fear about money it's a fear about relationships it's a fear about employment and these things you go what's going to happen in the future uh, and then the other two are really panic right which is that sudden fear when something happens suddenly uh, and surprises you and then you have a phobia right which is like it's a rational fear connected to a specific place or a person or a thing so that's what hem is and then but hosen so hosen is is grieving over the past, not dwelling on the past, not necessarily meant to be understood as dwelling over the past, but it's having a sense of, you know, I could have done better in the past. That's what it is. I could have done better in the past, and therefore I will take lessons from this and improve myself in the future. So that's why there's harm. So, for example, to the extent, so back to the statement, Malik bin Dinar, he says, to the extent that you grieve over the dunya, likewise you will be relieved of the anxiety of the of the akhirah. However, there is harm, so that's his quote, and then to comment on this, there, there is harm in excessive thinking, in excessive thinking about the past, all right? And this is why Imam Josie says, no, that thinking... It, it, that, that, or that the or he says no that thinking what is sought by it is to correct that which has been neglected and to look at the benefits and to look at some future benefit right so if, if you're thinking about the past and you're thinking about how you've fallen short in your relationship with the law in the past the sins you've committed the obligations that you you fail to fulfill if you're going to take that and think, okay, I now need to improve myself. I need to up my game. I need to not go back to those sins. And I need to not neglect those obligations, responsibilities that I have and better myself. Then there's benefit. But if it's just, if it doesn't produce a correction of your ways, and if it doesn't produce a future benefit, then it's harmful. Because if you're just going to spend your entire time uh, grieving, so to speak, over your past and thinking, oh, I can't believe I did that. I can't believe I failed. I can't believe I was sinning like that. Oh, no. He's, Imam al-Jawzi, his words are, if, if, if that becomes Allah, if the kathra, anhak al-badin. Anhak al-badin. If that continues, you're going to just destroy your body. Your body's just going to be destroyed. You're going to wear yourself out. And that's what, and that's what grief can do to people. Right? When, people, when people are in a serious state of grief and sorrow, they stop eating, they don't sleep properly, and then they start withering away. Their health deteriorates, and they lose ridiculous amounts of weight. So, in conclusion to this paragraph, we say, then, We seek refuge in Allah from anxiety and from grief, of this type especially. Uh, and, the, and the poet has said, it's from the nature of this world, the nature of the world to have this, this hem and this huzun. But it needs to be controlled and tempered. You know, it's natural. It's natural to be uh, and normal to be thinking about the future, but you're not there yet. So why are you stressing over it? Why are you wearing yourself thin just thinking about the future? You know, have a good opinion of Allah 
And when you arrive at that point in the future, Allah will provide you with the resources that you need to deal with that situation. Uh, the poet also mentions uh, uh which is poverty. I poverty and hardship and difficulty, which has been mentioned above. And then he mentions, uh, because that's again, that's in the ayah, uh, in Surah Baqarah, 155. And then he mentions complaints. And complaining is a natural consequence, it's anticipated, it's expected, uh, of everything that's been mentioned in these two verses, right? So, of course, when you have to, when you have to deal with uh, poverty, when you have to deal with calamities, when you when you have to deal with sorrows and grief, of course, when tribulations come, it's natural that you would complain. Uh, so problems and hardships, they push us to complain, and it's unfortunate, it's unfortunate that a large number of us complain to anyone who will listen, Right? We, compl we complain about our problems to almost anyone who will listen. Oh, have you heard about my situation? Oh, do you know what happened to me? Oh, you never believe what so-and-so did to me the other day. Constant complaining. However, to anyone, right? What is sought is that we only complain to Allah. And this is why uh, there's a reference here. So what's been quoted here is what Allah the Exalted says on the tongue of his prophet Yaqub alayhi salam and this is in Surah Al-Baqarah uh, Surah, Surah Yusuf, the 12th Surah, I 86 Yaqub says he's, I make complaint about my grief and sorrow to Allah alone Allahumma ilayka ashku sorry innama ashku bathi wa huzni illallah and then we also have the dua of the Master of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam after he had been Expelled from Taif. He said, Oh Allah, to you alone I complain about the frailty or the weakness of my strength and the lack of my, of my ability or my power. So we have wisdom here that we, you know, we, we complain so much. We complain so much in this world about things, but we should remember that we should complain to the one who actually changes things, the one who can actually change our state. And we ask Allah to put us at ease to give us patience and we ask Allah to always let us have a good opinion of him because that's the hadith the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi says hadith Qudsi ana inda dhani abdi bi I am as my slave sees me so if you see Allah as just and you see Allah as wise if you see Allah as merciful you will get through the trials and tribulations of your life. But if you see a law at some level in your mind or in your subconscious, if you if you see a law as being unjust and as being oppressive and is you know he's making your life miserable, then that's pretty much how your life is going to be. You are, uh, like Allah has said, I am as my slave sees me. So what 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 that goes back to is you have to correct how you are with Allah and how you see Allah. And then the poet continues and he says, uh, he says, بَيْنَ الْفَتَاءَ فِيهَا بِمَنْزِلَةٍ إِذْ صَارَ تَحْتَ تُرَابِهَا مُلْقَى So, in other words, what this means is you see a young person who has some rank in this dunya a young person has some rank in this dunya or some wealth or whatever or something similar and then death catches up with him from where we do not expect it and then he's just thrown or placed under the earth and as Muslims and this is true this is in our Muslims and as Muslims in Islam we we pray over our dead and we bury, we bury them immediately Right? This is what this is what why it happens so quickly. It's like someone someone could die in the morning and then at Dhuhr there's the janazah and that's it, they're buried. Someone dies at Asr and they're buried at Maghrib or Isha. It happens very, very quickly. 
There's no delay, there's no waiting. And therefore, the time between the spirit leaving the body and the body being placed in the earth is very, very short. It can be a day or less than a day. So what the poet, so the poet is stressing this point. There's, a, there's two, there's, it's like there's two things he's looking at here. He's looking at the shortness of life, but then also the shortness of the time between someone's death and how quickly they're put in the earth. Uh, so at the same time, it could be indicating that, for example, someone is young, someone is young, and they're at the height of their powers, and they're very active, and they're very mobile, and then this young person very quickly becomes elderly. It doesn't take a lot of time. It doesn't take a long time for someone who's young to become old. Okay. And then he says, "Takfu masawiha mahasinaha ula shay'a bin al-na'i wa bushra." Now I, I go into some uh, there's some Arabic notes here, right? Bi masawiha wa yaksud al-shay'a masa masa uh musa wi wiha, right? So instead of a ya there should be a hamza because the khif al-hamza fi hi lughat al-Quraysh. So in the language of the Quraysh you um I think this is in the, in the, in the Riwaya of um, or the, the, the Qari, uh, Ibn Kathir al-Nakki, in his, in his, his, in his recitation of the Qur'an, uh, the Hamza is, it, it's mukhaffafa, right? It's, it's, not, it's, it's not articulated clearly, right? It's, just, it's sort of, uh, it's said as the, as the long vowel, for example, in this case, like you'd say, like, you would say E instead of E, and so on and so forth. But this is a, that's, a, that's, that's off topic. Um... So, awa'ikuha, these are a lot, what, what he means by musawiha or musawiha is awa'ikuha, which means it's, it's obstacles and it's impediments and it's obstructions and so forth. Uh, and what that means is basically that Good things follow ba bad things follow good things, and comfort is followed by hardship. And then after that, the poet indicates that one more time that there's a short, there's a very very short passing of time. Right, that's not really, it's not, it's not very considerable, between the glad tidings of a birth of someone of so and so, and then the announcement that they have died. So, a uh, 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 and Bushra, so Na'a is like this uh, this announcement of death, and then Bushra is this glad tidings of someone being born. So he says the next line, he says, لَقَلْ لَيَوْمٌ ذَرَّ شَارِقُهُ Right? ذَرَّ شَارِقُهُ is what it means is the rising of the sun. إِذَا سَمِعْتُ بِهَذِكْ يُنْعَى So what he's saying here is rarely... Does the sun rise on a new day? Except that I hear a new death announcement. That's, that's what that's what it's referring to. Like uh, uh, from in Yuna, it's referring to to a, to a death call or an announcement of someone's death. So he says it's very very rare that I wake up in the morning, or the sun rises on a new day, and I don't hear about someone's passing. So he says. In this final line here, it says, min min al -ahya, thum like, like, do you not reckon that you see someone living and then you see them amongst the dead? So in other words, what he's saying is, I think about your state. I think he's addressing the reader here, so to speak. Right? I'm thinking about your state. Uh, do you reflect on the states of people and, and therefore you see them living and then you see them deceased? Or in other words, is an obligation upon every individual person to reflect on his life and his deeds and to prepare for that which there's no escape from, which is none other than death. It is not for man to rely on the dunya, this worldly life, for it is short and filled with trials and afflictions 
and it could end at any moment. Whereas the akhira is khayr wa amaqa, right? The akhira, this is the it's sort of a'la, uh, based on the ayah sort of a'la. The akhira is better and longer lasting. And finally, if we find raha, if we find comfort and relaxation in these words, in these lines of poetry, then really what they should be is they should be like an exit from hem and 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 the gum and huzn. They should be a, a, an exit. When we take these words and reflect on them, what's being said here is when we look at these words and reflect on them, they, they should be a way out for us from anxiety and grief and worry and sorrow. Kaif wali madha. How and why? Because when you acknowledge and you realize that this life is completely removed, is completely remote and removed from perfection and idealism. As it's not I mean, in the sense that it's it's uh, the state of mithalia, the state of being ideal. That should push you to submit to Allah's qada and qadr, Allah's decree and predestination. Because if you don't have this, you will spend your the days of your life and you're going to be seeking this perfection, seeking this ideal life. Or that thing that you think will give you perfection or give you eternal bliss. And when you're looking for this thing, you're actually looking for something that does not exist. And therefore, you're going to lose a great amount. You're going to waste a great amount of your time and your effort and your energy. And the result will be nothing except for intense pain and sorrow in your heart and in your soul. So may Allah reward this poet for these words that bring peace to, to, to our hearts, bring peace to our, to our emotions, and send our souls back to the truth. Sorry, that's coming across a pretty rough translation, I think. But again, it's this it's when we when we accept and we acknowledge the fact, that's basically what's being said here, is when, when we accept and we acknowledge the fact that this life is not perfect. It's not meant to be perfect. And we go back to the verse in Surah Al-Baqarah 155 where Allah makes this very, very clear. Like you are definitely going to be tested. This is, this is an abode of tribulation. You will be tested. You're going to be tested in your health. You'll be tested in your wealth. You'll be tested with uh, the love, uh, the death of loved ones. And this is normal. And then when you, when you accept these things, and you uh, acknowledge them not just at a mental level, but you acknowledge them at a at a deeper level, you know, for want of a better word, at a spiritual level. Then you can learn to accept things, and you can learn to move on from things, and not to be overcome by by grief and bitterness and resentment, because we've all. We've all been there. And it's, again, it's something I always talk about on my podcast is, uh, you know, the victim mentality. Something I always bring up here on my blog as well. And it's in my book, The Big Step, you know, the victim mentality, how, you know, and again, it's encouraged by the acad- by academia in the, in the Anglo sphere. It's encouraged by the media. This, this idea that you should feel sorry for yourself and you should be depressed and you should constantly be reminding yourself and everyone else about, all the the hard or all the hardships and afflictions you've been through in your life, and it's not to gainsay people's hardships. People go through hard things. People have gone through horrible diseases. People have lost lost loved ones. People there are people who are orphans. There are people who have lost their children. There are people who've lost their, and they've they've lost loved ones through uh, disease. Diseases like cancer, they've lost their loved ones through merely old age, or it could be through uh, the straight cold-blooded murder, as we saw recently in the news. But are you supposed to allow that? Are you supposed to allow these afflictions to push you into a state of despair and complete and utter grief? 
where you completely lose control of your life. Because this is, this is what, what happens to people. Because, you know, in the, in the, the common popular psychological parlance, it's like you, you know, your life is in a state of order. And then the death of a loved one, whether it's a parent, a child, a spouse, a sibling, this can push you into chaos. This can, you can go from like things are orderly and nice and pretty and everything's going well, and then you get thrown to the state of chaos. And how do you control that? How do you control that? So when you're in this dark place, you're in this place of despair and grief and you're thinking well how do I make sense of this you know it's interesting I I heard this on a recent podcast Some, someone uh, put it this way they said sometimes sometimes in life you find yourself in the middle of nowhere but sometimes in the middle of nowhere you find yourself like when you're in those states of utter tribulation, sometimes you, that, that gives you the chance to sort of sit back and realize, okay, what really matters? What is it in my life that really, really matters? And what is it in my life that I really need to be focusing on? Or to take it even deeper, like who, who am I really? This is one of the things I put in my book, The Big Step, in the introduction, or in, the, in, the, in chapter one. I said, when you become a Muslim, and you enter into a relationship with Allah, that's when you realize who you really are. Right? This is what, this is what it's about. You're, you're, you're becoming who you are supposed to be. And you're recognizing, okay, this is who I am. I'm an own slave. I'm a Abdul Mamluk. It's Allah who owns me. It's Allah who is in control here. And I need to build this relationship and work on this relationship. Right? In the middle of nowhere, you sometimes in the middle of nowhere you can find yourself. You find out who you really are. And you realize what, what, what is important. And then when you think about the the death of those who you love, like again, whether whether it's a spouse, a sibling, a parent, a child. Um and you have to think, well, what what am I supposed to do with my life now? Right? This is this is where this comes up. You think to yourself, well, what am I, what am I supposed to do with my life now? I don't have, for example, the parents. Like I don't have a mother. I don't have a father. What am I supposed to do now with my life? Well, why not stop and think? Well, what did my parents give me? What did my mother give me? What did my father give me? What did they teach me? And especially if you're in the case where you know you have Muslim parents and they they, go, they taught you how to pray, they taught you how to fast, they taught you how to read the Quran, they taught you how to have good manners and good character. They taught you how to be disciplined. They taught you all these things. They made you who you are. And now they've gone back to Allah. Are you now going to? ignore everything they've taught you? Are you going to forget and neglect everything they taught you? Or are you going to say, no, I need to show gratitude to my parents for the sacrifices that they made. They made sacrifices for me to ensure that I would be a decent human being and I would be a good Muslim. They made all these sacrifices. And therefore, I should should show my gratitude to Allah and I should show my gratitude to them by making myself a better person by making myself the best person that I can be making myself the best believer that I can be because going into depression and playing the victim and just feeling sorry for myself and just putting my, my uh, putting my, my face in my hands and just feeling sad every day. How, how are you showing gratitude to Allah? And how are you showing gratitude to your parents for what they've done for you? As for the death of children, we cover that 
uh, in the hadith. You know, subhanAllah. You know, Allah, Allah says to the angels, have you, have you taken the fruit of his heart? You've, you take, you've taken the child of my slave. Have you taken the fruit of his heart? And they say, we have. And what, how does my slave respond? He says, he, pra he praises you. He praises you. And he says, to Allah, we belong to him we return. But we always have to remember that. That and again, with and with things like what recently happened in the news ten days ago, because um, I, I, I I read a I read an interesting article re regarding uh, one of the school shootings in the United States. Someone sent me an article, um, and there's this thing called you know there's a, there's a psychological thing called survivor's guilt. Um, where you know, someone is there, they're actually present at uh, you know a massacre. You know whether, whether it's at a masjid or it's at a, a school or whatever it is, where you know many people were gunned down, were gunned down, and uh, some someone survives, and they start thinking, well, like why me? Why me? How, how, why is it that my my entire family's dead? Or all my friends are dead. I've lost everyone. But I'm alive. Why am I alive? Why wasn't I killed along with everyone else? Why me? And this this drives people. This can drive people crazy. And it can drive people towards suicide because they think, you know, I should have died that day. And it's like no, no, no. You have to understand that everyone dies at the point that a law has decreed that they will die. No, one, no one's death is delayed. No one's death is brought forward. You die the exact moment you were meant to die. That's That applies to everyone. So instead, you are allowed to live. Be grateful. Be grateful to Allah that he allowed you to live. And then at the same time, think about those people you've lost. Think about your friends. Think about your, your whether it's parents or children or siblings or whatever and think about the sacrifices they made for you and say am I going to throw that all away they did so much for me to help me in my life am I just going to throw that all away and become depressed and become an alcoholic and start abusing drugs and not doing it no you, you were allowed to survive make the most of it be the best believer that you can be that's what you have to do that's what you have to do there's no there really is no alternative when you boil it down. And Allah knows best. I think, uh, inshallah, I will finish there. I've been talking for quite a while. Um, I hope everything is clear. I will make a, I will make a, I'll place a link to the original Arabic text. Um, forgive me for any uh, mispronunci mis mispronunciations or any um, slurred words. Uh, it's very early in the morning here. But alhamdulillah, uh, I hope this is some benefit. And inshallah, um, before I sign off here, like, I do have, I'm very, very busy these days. I have lots of assignments to do. Uh, but I did want to get this podcast out. And I do want to do one more podcast uh, before Ramadan uh, about um, protecting the stomach. Um, it's a, uh, it's based on something I translated uh, by Imam Ghazali. Uh, I believe his book is called Minhaj al Abidin. So uh, it's on. It's again. That's an article on my blog. That's an article that's on my blog. I've translated it and, and published it on my blog. But I will do a podcast on that inshallah because it is very very relevant to Ramadan, the wisdoms of Ramadan. Uh, so I hope inshallah I will be. I will have time. Allah will bless me with some time in the next few weeks to do that. But alhamdulillah, uh, this one is done. I need to finish and get back to my my work and my assignments. And with Allah alone, there is success. السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته